<clears throat> so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last lecture of the fourth round <laughs> of this series of, uh, of, of lectures. And um, as you know, the speaker is uh, Professor Sinaiski, and um, we are all looking forward to see what he wants to share this afternoon with us. So Ilya, if you want to start sharing your screen, you are most than welcome. Francesco. Good afternoon, everyone. So, what we're going to do with you today is will be a little bit of theory and again a little bit of tutorials. So, before I share my iPad screen, let me share my uh, Firefox screen. And I'll tell you a couple of things. Yeah. So. Uh, Okay, so I updated my... Ilya, sorry, before you start talking, there is a little bit of a background noise interfering with your microphone. What about now? I have a good Francesco. Yeah, no, now it's fine. Now it's gone. It, it was probably, okay, so... I don't know what it was, but... Yeah, I just want to tell quickly that I a little bit reshuffled my GitHub, so I then put all tutorials into the tutorial folder, so that it's a little bit epsilon more organized. And today, after theory, I'm mainly going to go kind of I'm very will very heavily draw on the examples which are coming from this paper and this QSkit uh, kind of GitHub repo. Yeah, so I just uh, uh, now it's working. Yeah, so this is a GitHub repo on of Matteo Rossi on open quantum systems, which I, I really suggest that you go through afterwards. And this is a GitHub repo again by Matteo Rossi, which is uh, a company, the paper which was mentioned, which is mentioned here. Yes, and kind of the original of the paper you can always get for free because it's uh, an NPJ quantum information. Okay, so now let me go to the to my iPad and also I upload it into the Moodle folder, the lectures. So, so the notes which I'm go, going to go through now should be available. Okay, so, and uh, what we're going to talk about today will be three things, but I'm, I'll do my best to be on time. As we know, Francesco will need to leave, so okay. So I'm very briefly going to tell you another approach to the open quantum systems, which is called collisional models. And um, and kind of on Friday, I will tell you the last approach kind of is the most famous one to the open quantum systems, which is based on st uh, stochastic analysis. But I think collisional models are also very interesting and kind of uh, useful approach. And I will just very, very briefly show you a couple of things related to that. Afterwards, we are going to do extremely fast, very informal introduction to the quantum computing. And I'm going to tell a few words about the digital quantum simulation of uh, open quantum systems, uh, kind of what we want to have it ideally and what we have right now, kind of what we can do right now. And we're going to go through a couple of examples. Okay, so let's start. Uh, collisional models, this is kind of the title of this uh, approach in the physics literature. In mathematics literature and more mathematical physics literature, it's used a uh, repeated interaction approach, or sometimes if your interaction of, of the special kind, it could be indirect measurement approach. So kind of all these things means roughly one and the same thing. And uh, the basic idea is that uh, how we done microscopic model, uh, we were saying that, okay, our system is interacting with the bath and it's interacting with the whole bath simultaneously. Kind of, it's interacting with every piece of the bath. And now the question is, can we kind of stretch the time and say that our system is interacted only with one piece of the bath at one time for some time tau, and afterwards we never see this bit again. And afterwards we're going to interact so with the second bit of the bath, afterwards with the third bit, fourth bit, and so on and so forth. And 
as the result, we do kind of a whole bunch of iter iterative steps. And this is as quantum channels is a discrete approach. And kind of in the simplest case, what do we have? We have some system, which is initially in some state, both, which is just a collection of these agents with whom we can interact. And in the first step, we interact with the first agent, meaning that we apply some unitary, which is describing to us interaction between the system and both, and the only first element in the both. Afterwards, we trace it out and kind of it's disappeared. And afterwards, we go to the second step and we do the same with the second piece of the both. So when we do it iteratively so that we can have kind of the state of the system after the n plus one uh, step or kind of after the end step. And of course, what we can do sometimes, not too often, we can take an infinite limit here and obtain some thermal or steady state. Or we can also do, which is much more practical, and that's why people like and enjoy doing these things. You can do continuum limit and you can do two types of continuum limit. You can do a continuum limit for the state. So kind of, and you can find how the state depending on not on discrete time, which was labeling to you like first step, second step, third step, and so on and so forth. Or you can do a continuum limit. And from this kind of discrete equation, which related relate to each other n plus one step and kind of state of the density matrix on the n step, you can get some sort of master equation. And uh, you can show that under certain condition, this would be exactly GKSL master equation. And that's why kind of this approach is also gaining popularity because also it allows you to obtain kind of the same results using slightly different uh, footing. And it's also allows you different uh, kind of, how to say, modifications and gains. For example, what you can play with in such approaches, you can play with time and you can say that, okay, now your time of interaction is not fixed. And it's given by some random distribution. So that's uh, that's how you can, for example, obtain something which will be not of GKSL form or, or some kind of some other form or some kind of more general equations, with, which will be not necessarily Markovian. Or you can, for example, say that uh, this unitary operator is coupling not only your system and the first element of the bot, but it might be coupling first and second element of the bot. And in this case, you need to have here first and second element of the bot. But on the first step, you're only tracing out the, fir the first bot or first kind of element of the bot. The second element of the bot is remaining and it will be only traced out on the second step while you still have a kind of the, the third element of the bot already here. And in this case, you get kind of a simulation of something like a memory effect because you will be always have something in the bath which is surviving from the previous kind of iteration and you can build up your theory based on that and there are kind of a lot of physics literature which is re related to the non-markovian or memory preserving uh, kind of collisional models okay so and just to give you an example which we already have seen quite a bunch of times and we have very clear physical interpretation of this uh, let's say that we have a two-level system which is in an excited state and our bodies are all identical and they're in the ground state. Yes. And uh, let's say they interact in a flip flop fashion again. So, so what could happen? This, I mean, system could go down. And in that case, uh, uh, element of the bot will get excited and vice versa. That's the only process which is available for us. And with this kind of generic recipe, what we do, with, we calculate using this Hamiltonian. We calculate unitary operator. It will look like this. You can do it by hand, or you can ask Mathematica to do it for you. Or you can ask Python together with a SciPy, or a SymPy, sorry, not SciPy, but SymPy. And after we get this four by four matrix, we can trace it out and we can see that after the first step, the density matrix is going to look like this. If we do case steps, we can convince ourselves that the density matrix will look like this. Okay. so. What have we learned from this very, very simple example? We have learned a couple of things. First, for some generic time, which is not equal to pi n, which is very specific time, yes? So this will be just a number which is smaller than one, yeah? It will be some positive number between zero and one, which is to the power k will give us zero. So cosines will go to zero and we'll get a ground state, which is stayed down, which is as expected. So what we 
describing with you, we're describing with you serialization. Yes. So we have an excited atom, which is coming into the contact with the bus, which is simulated by the bunch of spins, which are kind of two level systems which are down. They interact for a little while, and afterwards, kind of your system is adapting a little bit, and the first element disappear. Second element, they interact a little bit, disappear, and we do it iteratively. But what we expect that your system, which was initially excited, should come to the thermal equilibrium with this infinite chain of uh, two level systems, so kind of with this bus, and it's coming because it's becoming the excited. Great. So kind of first bit of physics. Second bit of physics, let's try doing continuum limit. So yes, kind of, let's say that this time tau, which we have here, is in fact our kind of current time t divided by some k, where, where the k is the number of tries. Okay, and in order, because now we need to obtain something reasonable. And in order to obtain something reasonable, because you can try doing the substitution, taking the limit of k going to infinity, but you might see that nothing reasonable is coming out. And what you can say is that, okay, let's, let's add a little bit of physics. Let's assume that this is a weak coupling and how weak, uh, how weak we, in order to obtain something, we need to say something like this. So that this, because from here we'll get that tau is formally dependent on K and it's dependent on K in a such a way that the G squared multiplied by tau is equal to constant, irrelevant of K. So kind of as, so it's mean that the G is now just uh, proportional uh, to this concept. I mean, the, the smallness of the G is proportional to the square root of K. This is a very simple statement, but what, what does it do physically? We're introducing the coarse graining of time. And we always do it in the theory of open quantum systems. Because when we separate the times, when I'm telling you in the microscopic derivation that uh, let's assume that the, the excitation which is coming into the bath disappears what does it mean? It means that I'm hiding under the rug. I'm hiding the coarse gradient of time. I'm hiding the fact because any kind of interaction will take time. But what I'm telling to you that this time, which is telling, uh, which is takes the excitation to go into the bath and kind of propagate into the bath and lost kind of any resemblance to the system is essentially zero. So that's what I'm telling you. So, and in, in many cases, it could be very small compared to the other parameters, for example, in traditional quantum optics, but it doesn't mean that it's zero. But when you do this kind of equations, you do effective coarse graining. This is also another form of coarse graining, okay? So this will be a constant. And now we can take a limit of the K going to infinity in this equation. Yes, keeping in mind that G squared tau is equal to constant. So we can do just for the cosine. Yes, kind of we get, uh, we get something like this. We expand the cosine into the one minus G squared tau squared over two. So G squared tau is gamma. We get something like this. We get extra factor over K, K, and this is standard exponential. And what have we got that we get that under these assumptions, under the assumption of weak coupling. And by the way, this is exactly the same assumption which is formally introduced. So if we would go very mathematical route of defining when the uh, garin kazakowski limbot sudarshan equation popping up kind of from the theory under which conditions we can say that the system is described by that equation, we would have to, to do something like that. We would have to, to introduce a new time which would be rescaled exactly like that. So the fact that we're getting from here the same constant is uh, kind of for the people who is doing open quantum system is not surprising and is expected and logical. Okay, so we're getting e to the minus gamma of t here, and here is of course one minus e to the minus gamma of t. And if you've seen in one of my previous lectures, I introduced to you the simplest equation for the dissipation of the two level system into the heat bath, and at zero temperature, that's exactly will be the solution. Okay, so again, what does it mean that our system is excited and our bath is de-excited? The bath is usually at thermal equilibrium, and if it's kind of all the two level system in the, uh, in, the state, in the state down, it means that the system is in the ground state. And when it's in the ground state, when it's at the zero temperature. So the fact that we're obtaining the solution, which is equivalent to the solution of this equation is fine. And in some sense is expected, but we again, from this uh, repeated interaction approach, we're learning that thing. 
And the question now I'm going now to show you how we can even derive this equation exactly from 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 kind of from this formula, or better to say, from this uh, expression. Okay, so let's do it. So we have our row s at the step k plus one is equal to choice over k. We have our exponentials, continuity operators, and the bath and the system at the state k. So now we expand these exponentials up to the quadratic terms. And we kind of use our explicit expressions. And if you do it, you can do it explicitly. You are going to have, uh, so you're going to have the identity kind of term which is proportional to the tau in the zero. So that will be this term. Linear terms, this kind of, which is coming from this, this term and identity on the both sides, uh, the traces will be equal to zero because of the state of the bath. And uh, the last thing, there will be quadratic terms. So in quadratic terms in tau will come from this term. So that will be the anti-commutated term. And this term on the both sides will give us this term. So it could be rearranged in the following picture. And immediately, we could already recognize our Gorin-Kozakowski-Sudarshan, almost Gorin-Kozakowski-Sudarshan equation. The only thing which is uh, remain to do, we need to replace this g tau squared by our weak limit, so g squared tau is gamma, so we get tau here to zero, and this final final difference we replace by the derivative, and we obtain this standard and famous equation. Okay, so this is very brief, very simple introduction to you to what what is called collisional models or repeated interactions. And sometimes you can, at the certain condition, as I mentioned, you can see it as an indirect measurement because if you would uh, consider such interactions which doesn't change too much state of the system, something which is called non-demolition measurements. So if essentially Hamiltonian of the system and bath will interaction will commute to the system. By measuring states of your bath, you're learning a little bit information about the system but without directly measuring the system. And that's why the, such approaches sometimes is called a uh, indirect, indirect measurement approach. And essentially such approaches were, for example, performed experimentally uh, by the group of the search Karosh and uh, kind of the, for the, uh, to, to monitor the state of the uh, bosonic mode in the cavity. So it can, they have a system. Mm -hmm. okay. So they have a system which we're looking like this, so they will have a, two mirrors at a very, very low temperature, very high quality mirrors. And the atoms were flying through, but they were off resonance with the cavity. So in the cavity, you have a, some radiation. It's all at very, very low temperature so that there is a, not just a lot of radiation, just a little bit of few photons. And as the atoms flying through, you can measure the state of the atoms and based on that, you can afterwards conclude what is the state of the uh, photonic mode in the cavity. So and this is a set of very famous experiments. Okay, so now let's go into the very, very brief introduction to the quantum computing. So, and it's kind of extremely brief and very informal because I'm just going to introduce to you out of the quantum computing in general, the things which we need because we need not all the ideas from quantum computing, we need a very, very narrow subset. Okay, so the ideas in the quantum computing are built by analogy to the classical computing, of course, with certain additions. So in the classical computing, we know that the information is stored in bits, zeros and ones, and there is also a universal gate, which is called NAND gate. So and if in principle you, ha you, you have a NAND gate and the system of zeros and ones, you can create any kind of executable circuit. So, and you can perform any executable calculation. Ah, okay, there is a question in the chat related to the previous section is what happens with the initial state of the system and the environment and the environment have any kind of correlation, the collisional method still works. Yes, the collisional method is still working. 
So uh, it just depends. So there are uh, what what you can do. You can you can do two possibilities. So you can do a possibility. So when there is a correlations in the bath between the bath and zillas, and in that case you just and where is my generic formula? You just keep them all the anzillas here because formally what I can write I can write product of all of them and I'm tracing only the first one and all the rest they just not not evolved by this unitary operator afterwards I'm tracing out the second one third one fourth one and so on and so and correlations are going to modify it within the bath and the system bath and propagates as the function of uh, this form of uh, system bath interaction or kind of uh, the number of steps you're doing so this is fine, this is possible, and that is working. You can also do it for the initial system bath correlations. So if you have a system correlation and a bath correlation, so this is not a product state. This is also some sort of entangled state or kind of classically correlated state. You can also do it because formally, you know, I just write it as a, because as I mentioned, it's kind of, it's the simplest case, but in more general cases, you can, you can also consider it and people do it. And in that uh, wrapper, which I mentioned, about the IBM Q, uh, they consider, um, they, they do the simulation of the two collisional models. One collisional model where they have the, the bath is given by the separate states and another when the bath is given by the totally mixed but uh, classically uh, uh, correlated state, which is looking like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 plus 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 one half of this. I mean, but this is a kind of statistic, a statistical mixture of zero and one, but not in every, but all zeros or all ones. And in that case, you observe rather different behavior. And if you just go to that repo, you can, or in the paper, you can see the difference in the behavior. And there is also in that paper, there is a link on the original paper where that had been done. Otherwise, it's a very nice question. Thank you. Okay, so let's go back to quantum computing. Okay, so in the classical computing, as I mentioned to you, we have zero and ones, and we have a NAND gate, so NAND logic, and NAND gate is not end gate. And I just here, just for, for fun, or kind of for the reference, wrote down what does it mean, the not end gate. So end gate is logical multiplication, yes? So zero, zero, input zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, and one, one, give you one. NAND is not of this gate, so it's one, 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 zero. And there is a theorem which is saying that if you have this gate, you can build up all the rest logical operations. And you can do play the same games uh, with the NOR gate. Okay, so in quantum computing, you try to do something similar, or at least, you know, in order to kind of to treat quantum computing as the part of information science, you try to do something similar. So the bits are replaced by qubits. And of course, qubit is just a linear combination of zero and one. And now you can be not only the state zero and one, but every way in between. And of course, alpha and beta are normalized on one, uh, meaning that alpha modulus squared plus beta modulus squared is equal to one. Yeah, just two complex numbers. Okay, so, and the, there is also analog of this NAND gate or universal gate, but unfortunately you cannot do it with one gate, you do it with a few gates. And uh, this uh, set is usually called universal gate set. And uh, there are different universal gate sets. There is not unique. I mean, you can define it as a matter of your convenience uh, or as a matter of, for example, of your hardware, because in your kind of physical implementation of quantum computing, you might be in a situation when you can do some gates better than the others. So in this case, you might play with the, what set of gates you're calling universal set of gates. And here I give an example of very standard universal set of gates, which is single qubit gates plus C naught gate. Single qubit gates, to be more precise, in order to, to cover all possible single qubit Operation, you need something just called S gate, H gate, and T gate. So H gate is a Hadamard gate. So it's a, it's a two qubit matrix, which is looking like this. S is the square root of sigma Z. And T gate is the square root of S, formally speaking, but I mean the corresponding square root. So when using these three gates, you can construct any single qubit operation. But if you add C naught on top of that, you can decompose any unitary of d by d or kind of n by n size into the 
combination of these gates and that gate, which will act between the different qubits. And the procedure is called solovey kitaev algorithm. Okay? And the C0, what the C0 is, it's controlled NOT gate. So what does it do? It's act on two qubits. And if the first qubit in the state zero, it's do nothing. And if the first qubit in the state one, it flips it. So it's apply uh, Pauli X gate. And the Pauli X gate, X on zero is one, and X on one is zero. So X gate again is something is in, in the matrix notation in sigma Z basis is something which is looking like this. Okay. And of course, I mean, you can apply to the superposition. Okay, so typical quantum circuit. So now you can use these sets of gates to do some computing. And we are going to do some very kind of precise computing. I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of examples now of some problems which are kind of standard in the quantum computing. And afterwards, we're going to jump to the uh, problem which is called uh, quantum simulation. Okay, so your typical oops, quantum circuit is looking like you have initial state of your qubits. Traditionally, it's state zero, or you can have, you can add few gates here to initialize them to not zero state. Afterwards, you get a set of gates. So when the gates could be single qubit gates, two qubit gates, or kind of you can have a two qubit gates which apply in between this and this qubit, or you can have a three qubit gates because there is, for example, uh, universal set which is based on the Toffoli gate, which is a three qubit gate, and there are others. And afterwards, you do measurements. Okay, and as a function of your algorithm, you are not necessarily need, need to measure everything. You can just measure a couple of qubits, and in that case, mathematically, all the rest qubits will be traced out. You calculate a partial trace with respect to everything else except these two measurements. So this is kind of naive view. Okay, so what can we do with that? Let's, for example do a very, very basic and very simple example is creation of one of the Bell states. And if you open Nielsen and Chan in the first chapter, you're going to see this example, which is related to the all possible Bell states, but just to keep, to keep it sane, let's do the, this state. So we start with zero, zero. Afterwards, we need to apply Hadamard gate to the, to the first qubit. And afterwards, we need to apply C0 in the control in the first qubit and the action in the second qubit. Okay, so let's just write what we have on every step. Psi one here, nothing happens. So we start with zero, zero. Psi two, it's a Hadamar on the first guy, nothing on the second guy. So Hadamar on the first, nothing on the second. What we have, we have zero plus, so Hadamar, zero plus one on square root of two if it's act on zero. And if it's act on one, it's zero minus one over the square root of two. Okay, so we get, zero plus one over square root of two, and the second guy doesn't change. Second qubit is zero and zero, okay? So now we need to apply C0 to this state. And C0, what does C0 do? Where is my C0? If the control qubit is zero, nothing. And if the control qubit is one, flip the target qubit. So, so C0 on this state, and okay, I've written down to you. So we had control qubit and target qubit. So control qubit on this guy doing nothing. On this state, it doesn't act because here is zero, here is one and the states are orthogonal. So here is control qubit is one. It doesn't act on this state, it's given zero and acting on this state, it will give us, because it's one, we flip this state and we ending up with the bell state. And as you know, the bell state is one of the examples of the uh, highly entangled state or it's maximally entangled state between the two qubits. Okay, and it's very important in, for example, quantum cryptography. Okay, so, and as the last bit in the introduction to the quantum computing, I'm going to introduce you probably the very first quantum algorithm which was invented. It was invented by David Deutsch and it's called Deutsch algorithm after, afterwards. And that was exactly the algorithm where you could, or one could glimpse into the parallelism and the interference taken to get together in the quantum computing. And that's what is showing uh, how to say the, it's not really the power. You don't, in this example, you don't feel the power, but you feel that there's something is different. Okay, so in what kind of problem uh, does this algorithm solving? So it's solving very artificial problem, which kind of for 
many of us is very difficult to understand why this is a problem at all. But sometimes you need problems like this to get the feeling and afterwards they can, you know, bring you further because I would probably need to spend the two full lectures if, if I would like to explain to you how, for example, Shor's algorithm works, because in that case, we need to, to talk about many more things. But very simply, so we have a binary function, unknown binary function f of x. Binary function means that it's taken x's which are binary and it's taken in one binary number. So it's taking zero and one and spitting you out zero and one. And the question is, you need to find out is the function is balanced or unbalanced. Balance means that the f of zero is equal to f of one. Unbalance means that f of zero is not equal to f of one. So f of zero and f of one could be zero. They both could be one. And in this case, the function is balanced. And if they're one, zero, zero, one, the function is unbalanced. And in order to do it classically, we need to do it at least with the two measurements. Yes, we need to put f and zero, write down the answer f and one and write down the answer and afterwards compare the answers. So we need to do at least two queries to this function f. Okay, so how we can do it quantumly in a one query. So we need to do it in the following way. So in quantum kind of computing, you always assume the existence of kind of like how you query the function and you query the function using so-called oracles and you can kind of one can talk about how these oracles are constructed and there is a whole branch of quantum computing. And it's what does it do? It's take in the state x, y, and spit you out x and y plus f of x. So it's kind of like doing the query to this function f of x, where this plus in the circle is the addition by the modular 2. Addition by the modular 2, meaning 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, and 1 plus 1 is 0. Okay, so and this is unitary operation. So it's a well-defined operation, which is working like this. We input x, y, we're getting out x, y plus x, uh, f of x, okay? And the idea where the power of the algorithm is coming from is coming from the fact that if we're going to input here superposition, what we're going to have on output, we're going to have a state which is looking like this. And we kind of, we have made the one query to this unitary, but we get both answers simultaneously. And all the rest part of the Deutsch, Deutsch algorithm is how to measure this kind of, whether the functions are the same or different in one go. Because now formally we have the state, but it doesn't help if we don't know how to measure it. So, and how to do it, you do it in the following way. So you start here from the state zero, here you start from the state one, because this is zero on X, will give you state one. You apply Hadamard to the balls of these guys. You put them into your unitary. And afterwards you apply one more Hadamard and you do the measurements. And if you've done everything correctly, and this is kind of, this is one big unitary operation or this is one unitary circuit. You can do this unitary circuit. And in that case, you will know that. So, okay, let's see how the functions are looking like. So F zero is identity on X on zero, zero will give us zero one. F1, we apply now Hadamard to this and to this state. So this will be the first one will be with plus, the second one will be with minus. Okay, so now there will be a little trick which you might try to do, but you can just do it brute forcely. So that if we have any X, which means that it could be zero or one, yes? So kind of any of this state, when it's getting into this U, what it will give you out it will give you out minus one to the power f of x on the same state. So how you can understand it and where it's coming from? It's coming from just from checking the input. So you put here zero and f of x could be zero. Yes, you see what's happening. You put x is equal to zero, f of x could be one. So in that case, you will see that, okay, for if f of x is zero, you get here factor one, if f of x is one, you get factor minus one. The, you do the same game for the x is equal to one and f of x, and you will see that you can put all together all these four opportunities, x zero, f of x zero, x zero, f of x one, x one, f of x zero, and f of x one. You can put it together in the way which is looking like this. And now it means that what will happens after this state 
is going through this device or through this oracle, we're going to have a state which is looking like this. And as you see, the state is looking very in a very interesting way. Kind of this looking like almost like our input state, but this it will look like this only if f of zero is equal to f of one. And if f of zero is not equal to f of one, you're going to have something like this. And that's exactly why we need to apply one more Hadamard because application of Hadamard on this state will give us zero and application of Hadamard on this state will give us one. So and that's why exactly we have a Hadamard here. So we get something like this under the same conditions. And you know, if this step is a little bit fuzzy to you, I really suggest just write it down on a piece of paper, consider these four cases and you will get exactly, you see that you can put it together like this. Okay, so we get state like this and even more. So if the function is balanced, yes, if F0 is equal to F1, it means that modular two addition, so F0 plus F1 will be always equal to zero. So essentially this is standing here, addition by the modular two, oh, sorry, by the modular two, not by the modular one, so by the modular two, yes, because if, it, if it's balanced, so if it's zero, zero will give us zero. If it's one, one, it will give us zero again. And if it's unbalanced, it means that this addition will be always one. So it could be zero or one, zero and zero, one, yeah? So formally we get F3 is equal to this and we just measure. We measure this qubit and it's automatically tell us if it's zero, it means that the function is balanced. If it's one, it means that the function is unbalanced. So all of that is kind of aimed to demonstrate to you that you can do kind of an operation kind of which classically takes two, two queries, you can do it in the one query. Yes, of course, it's a little bit glorified query where you need to build up stuff around, but formally we are asking u of f only once. And that's kind of where the part of the power of the quantum computing is coming from. So if you want to know more about this and why kind of, because this is not very, excited example, but when you need to build up with more qubits, for example, you go to the deutsch jordan algorithm or you go to the uh, Simon algorithm and that Simon algorithm will be probably the first one where you can see the exponential speed up compared to every possible classical model of computation. And of course you get to the famous, afterwards you get to the famous Shor's algorithm, uh, which is also kind of quite far away from any implementation for, for anything real, which we cannot do, but still as a principle, this, this kind of algorithms can really demonstrate to you so-called exponential speed up in the time which is taken for the calculation of the corresponding uh, of the corresponding problem. Okay, so, and if you want to know more about kind of this kind of algorithmic aspects, you can get a very good kind of bird eye view of the uh, quantum algorithms in the recent tutorial by Andrew Childs it was given at the QIP 2021 and it's available on the YouTube. You just go to the YouTube, you type quantum algorithms, Andrew Childs or Childs QIP 2021 and you will get the YouTube link. It's a three hour video, but on the personal side of Andrew Childs, there is also the slides for this presentation and you can get all the references. So to just to get an idea, it's not weird algorithm like this, there is a huge zoo and family of algorithms which find very different and various applications and kind of by now it's it's a very interesting and exciting field and one of the subfields of the theory of the quantum algorithms is simulation of the quantum systems and that's what i'm going to talk about now okay so what is the problem of the simulation of the quantum systems and probably i have to start uh, unfortunately, I didn't put any pictures of Feynman and don't put the, any quotes of Feynman, but supposedly that's why Feynman invented kind of this or suggested this idea that you can use quantum mechanics to simulate quantum systems. So that was kind of original motivation in his famous talk where he says that, okay, it's clear that nature is fundamentally quantum mechanical and we might learn to use quantum mechanics to simulate quantum mechanics. So. So the original idea was not to do the, to break in RSA and kind of to make all the uh, world security uh, and cryptography unreliable. So original idea was to use quantum mechanics 
to simulate quantum mechanical processes, which we cannot just kind of physically simulate due to some due to natural limitations in the memory and so on and so forth. Okay, so what do we want to do? We wanted to be able to simulate this object e to the minus eth, yes, and apply it to some initial state. And afterwards, we want to kind of create a state like this for kind of complex enough Hamiltonian such that we cannot do it, you know, on our supercomputers or in any other way. And the question, and afterwards we need after we need also very careful to think what we want to measure because don't forget that for large enough systems, for example, if it's for example, if it's a spin Hamiltonian, yes, the number of components of this vector is going to grow as two to the power n. Yes, when the n is a number of spin. So if you want to, for example, experimentally describe the system of 100 spins, you get the numbers which are far beyond anything of possible or the kind of or comparable with the number of particles in the universe. So you can definitely could not have a storage to store the wave function of the 100 uh, spins. Okay, where you kind of write their state individually. So if you would invent some compressions and there are methods which are showing that for, for certain classes of Hamiltonians and for the certain class of situations, you can achieve certain very e efficient compression of this and you can still do it on the classical machines. But for the generic spin Hamiltonian, you can easily come up with a kind of examples where uh, Hamiltonian of 100 spins, I mean, the state of the wave function of 100 spins could not be stored. Okay, so. Now I'm going to tell you how we can do it quantum, uh, using quantum mechanics or quantum computing. So what we need to do, we need to decompose it to the smaller steps. And the idea is very simple. It's called Trotta formula. And uh, it's based on the following assumption. So that uh, if we have some two operators, A plus B, we can always write it like this. So that we can have it, so to say, like small step over A, afterwards small step over B, and if we do it n times, and if we put n to infinity, we're going to recover initial state. And the beauty of the uh, calculus is that for the all formulas like this, there is a final case formula with the error term. So kind of like you can you cannot do this infinitely many times, but if you say that you can do it capital N times, you can estimate what will be the size of error. So what will be the difference between this term and this uh, product for the final end states. Okay. So, and final corrections. So, for example, for the small step, I mean, the final corrections for just kind of brute force linearization is going like a delta squared, so that you might think uh, how to do it better. So, and there are methods of doing it better. The simple one is that you write the kind of this formula, I mean, this is kind of internal formula with a form like this. So, and this is already, uh, it's called higher order integrators. And this, in, in this case, the error is going like a delta cube. And of course you can generalize it when there are more terms than two. So you can generalize it for n terms. And in general case, there was the sequence of the papers, uh, which are all together derived something which is called now Suzuki Litrotto formulas. And uh, essentially what you get, you can introduce more, more terms with the kind of fractions of the of the kind of small moment delta, and it, as a uh, kind of you get more and more terms, but as the price of that, uh, this kind of the precision is growing. So you can allow to have a higher delta. And of course, what you have here, you have some sort of trade-off between the number of terms in your kind of in your expansion against the power. So kind of uh, for the for any real calculations, what you can do, you can see how many terms you can take such that you can still implement it on whatever computer you have. And afterwards kind of, uh, but you can still implement it certain number of times because when you take it to the power N, so if you can have a bigger Delta, you will have a smaller N. But if you have kind of a bigger Delta in order to compensate for that, you need to have more terms inside of the product and this kind of trade-off. Uh, which is quite natural in this situation. Okay, so and I'm going to give you quite a high level ex uh, example, which can give you a feeling how you can do it in principle. Uh, and I took that example from the also NPJ paper, NPJ quantum information, also quite recent from the uh, volume five 
109 from 2019. And in this paper, what the authors have done, they have looked for the implementation of various spin Hamiltonians on the current existing at that moment, 2019, uh, IBM quantum computers. And uh, so I'm just giving you one little example. So if we want to simulate, for example, spin chain, which is looking like this, which is a pretty standard spin chain, which you have some Hamiltonian of the uh, of kind of individual magnetization or kind of the individual magnetic fields. So you have a couplings between x, y, and you have a separate z coupling. So what you can do, you can separate in this manner into the two types of terms. You can separ separate AJs. Why you want to separate AJs? Because they are they commute with each other and so you can implement them simultaneously on the circuit and you can get bjs which are looking like this which is all a uh, couple terms and then you can separate into the odd and even terms so like you can separate terms which is for the spin one two three four five six and so on and the terms which are coupled to three uh five two three four <laughs> four five and so on and you will get kind of a three group of terms, which inside will commute with each other. So yes, kind of, we can have product of AIs, BJs even, BJs odd, and this is kind of the lowest order expansion. So it's going as a tau squared and you will get a circuit. Yes, which all AIs are single qubit gates. These BJs are coupling one set of the uh, or one couples of the qubits, these BJs are coupling other couples of the qubits, we might prepare some state. And this, this is a kind of a simple, a simple block, and you repeat this block many, many times. And afterwards, you do some measurement. And judging on the result of that measurement, you can say something about, for example, of magnetization of this spin as it depends from the time. Okay. And essentially, uh, yes, how, how, uh, what, what I want to tell you and why I'm showing you that, that we have everything in order to be able to do that. So age, to do the AJs are easy because there is a standard Z rotation gate. And so AJs are exactly this Z rotation. So and that's another motivation how you can decide how to decouple terms from each other. So with BJs, the history is a little bit more difficult. But uh, luckily there is for the two qubits unitaries there is, and that's why you want to decouple them even and odd because all even terms will commute with each other. So you can see them as the two qubit unitaries and all odd terms will also commute within its group. And you can also treat them as the two qubit unitaries. Two qubit unitaries is the kind of four by four unitary matrix. And for that, there is, I mean, in the group theory, there is a generic statement, which is called Cartan decomposition. But for the four by four unitaries, it's particularly nice because it allows you to write any unitary for the two qubits in the following product. And it's always possible. It will be two single qubit unitary gates on this side and on this side. And in between, there will be an operator, which is looking like this. So where you have XX, YY, ZZ, and the beauty of this term is that each of these terms is commuting with each other. So you can also relatively easily calculate it. And on the kind of on the hardware, this guy is implemented via circuit, which is looking like this. So you just in order to implement this guy, you just need the three C nodes, which is very cheap by the quantum computing standards. Okay. So and I have even better news if you decide to repeat those calculations. Because in the 2019 QSKIT, the package of the IBM was unable to do that automatically, and the people will have to tune when they were doing it. Currently, you can ask, ask QSKIT to decompose it for you, and it will exactly use, you can uh, tell to QSKIT to decompose using uh, Cartan decomposition or kind of using the C nodes, and it will decompose it for you. So you don't even need to think which parameters to take, you just give it unitary, and it's give you back circuit, which will look something like that. And afterwards, you can transpile it and do all the rest what you want to do. Okay, so that that's kind of a very basic idea how you can calculate Hamiltonian evolution. But that's not was our goal. Our goal was how we can calculate or how we can simulate the open quantum systems. And the first idea, which 
we're not going to go too far and I will just show you a couple of things and I will comment about the current status of Hamiltonian simulation. It's very simple. So let's say that we have our GKSL equation, yes. Uh, must equation, which we can write like this, and formally we can write it like this. And for this object, one can now just try to play absolutely the same game as one can play for the Hamiltonian simulation. The game will be similar, but not identical because there will be some things which are related to the, to the fact that uh, in the Hamiltonian simulation here you have uh, a Hamiltonian and altogether it's a unitary operator. While this operator is not a unitary operator, it's an element of the semigroup and the unitary operator element of the group. And you should be a little bit careful with a certain subtleties, but you can play the game in a very, very similar way. And here I give you two references for the papers where the people suggested how this game could be played. And one was written by the, uh, kind of co-authored by Andrew Childs, whose algorithms, uh, tutorial on algorithms are already advertised. So this was published in 2001. And afterwards also we contribute, I mean, uh, mine Francesco's uh, former PhD student, Ryan Swig, uh, show how to solve this problem for the arbitrary single qubit channels, including some tricks with the high order integrators. And, uh, but the, the idea is still the same. For example, in the single qubit case, you want to bring it to the special form and afterwards apply something like Littrotter formula. In this case, I write it in the very simple for, uh, kind of simple way and you can write it in the more kind of more sophisticated ways. And if you want to know how to do that, you are welcome to, to go to these references. And uh, Ryan also have done research into the going beyond a single qubit, uh, going to the arbitrary, uh, dimension of the system. So when this A, a is and rho is defined for the arbitrary n by n system. Okay, so, but the main problem of all of that, that in order to get a reasonable answer, we need to implement this circuit kind of a lot of times. So kind of, you remember, so we need to implement this block many, many, many times. And kind of ideally you want to implement it like a couple of hundred times. And this is far beyond anything which is possible on the modern quantum computers. Far, far beyond the coherence time. So by the moment when you do a few steps, depolarization will kind of depolarize your state to the fully mixed state very, very quickly. So, and the question is, what can we do now? So, and what can we do now is a little bit more pedestrian but still very nice and one can play the game of open quantum systems on the quantum computer and that will be the almost remaining part of my talk and I'm also going to show you in the uh, simulator by the QSKIT how to do it for the couple of channels. And the basic idea is that we don't want to simulate a kind of a master equation, we want to start with the simulation of the channel. And the basic idea of the simulation of the channel is looking like this. So we're going to have a channel and we're going to have some auxiliary qubits which are going to play a role of environment. And by the Steinspring dilation or by some other ideas, if we now choose the, this unitary in appropriate form, and how to choose this unitary is also a separate discussion. Uh, if we let the system evolve and if we implement this unitary, if we don't touch the qubits of the environment or we trace over them, mathematically speaking, what we can get that the result in Kind of state here will be as the result of application of the quantum channel. So formally something like this. And the, let's start with a very simple idea. And where we can get this idea, we can get from the circuit for the bell state, which I just shown you. So that's the circuit for the bell state. But if we now in that bell state trace out any of the qubit, I mean qubit one and qubit two, we are going to get a state which is looking like this. Yeah. So we're going to get totally mixed state. But if for, for a second forget that that was the bell state for the quantum cryptography, if we just give a look at this state, this state is looking like application of XX channel for the P is equal to one half, yeah? And that's the basic idea. Okay, what can we do to change this one half and to make sure that it's applied to the, not to the state zero, but to some arbitrary state. So this is very basic idea and that's what we're going to do. Okay, so where the one halves are coming from? One halves are coming from application of the Hadamard, which we can also write like this in this state, in this case. So 
Uh, and first, what we're going to do, first we're going to see what will happen if we apply it not to zero state, what will happen if we apply it to the arbitrary state. And remember that the C naught is controlled X, yes? Or kind of I will write it like this because we also need controlled Y's and controlled Z's. Okay, so if we do it for the arbitrary psi, the same circuit, but now we need to a little bit respect order. So we say that this guy is our system and this guy is our environment. So we get psi one, psi two, psi three. What do we have? Psi one is our initial state. Psi two is the Hadamard on our Anzilla. We get this. Psi three is C naught, but C naught in the reverse order. So our control target or control qubit is two. Target qubit is our system. So we get something like this. And so we get state like this, yeah? So because when the two is in zero, nothing. When the two is in one, we apply X, good. So, and if we now take this state, which is a pure state and trace this state, we're going to get channel, which is looking like this. So the last question, which we need to address in order to simulate X Pauli channel how to change these indices. And as I mentioned already, where the one house are coming from, they're coming from this Hadamar. And the natural question is, can we replace this Hadamar by something else? Yes, we can. So we can, there is a RY. And the reason why we are to take an RY is because RY just, it's a real rotation. It's becoming real. Uh, and we can do it kind of like, we can do the weights without extra phases so that we don't need to take care about the complex stuff. That's the only reason. So it will give something like this. So now we replace Hadamar by RY, which is looking like this. We apply to Psi Psi, play the same game and we get this. Now we have it. Now we have a circuit, which is simulating Pauli X channel. Yeah, we just need to say, this is P, this is one minus P or vice versa. P is probability of application of the channel. And we can very easily change it because cos squared is also like a probability, it's could be between zero and one as a function of theta. Okay. So, and one can check if we replace psi by rho, we're still going to get the same thing. So, and clearly we can play absolutely the same game if we replace x by y or by z. So we're going to get Pauli xx channel, yy and zz channels. Good. So now we already know how, to, how we can implement this kind of, or this sort of channel, right? So let's go into the next channel, which is called depolarizing channel, which is looking like this. So it's XX, YY and ZZ applied. And brute force idea, a very simple and straightforward idea is let's do the same thing here, but for each of them. And you can do it. So you do the same rotations, conditional X, conditional Y and conditional Z. You forget about these qubits, you measure this qubit and the result on this qubit will be exactly application of this map. And it's a little bit involved, but you can check. I mean, it's involved algebraically, it's just a little bit biggish expression with the cosines and sines that theta here, here is the same theta will be related to your probability here by this formula. Okay. So and I think the last example, which I'm going to show you, which will be a little bit more non-trivial, and I'm even not going to write to you the answer, uh, is called something just called Pauli channel or kind of general Pauli channel. And what is the general Pauli channel? Is you have identity term, XX, Y, Y, Z, Z, but the probabilities, here the probabilities are the same. Here, all the probabilities are different and you can control them. So Sigma zero in this notation is identity matrix. And some of all probabilities, of course, to one, sum of to one, and they're all bounded numbers between zero and one. Okay. So how you can implement it? You can implement it a little bit smarter than here, because what you have here, you have here four qubits. That's the first problem. I mean, it's not a problem. The problem, much more bigger problem, is connectivity. The fact that this qubit should be coupled to all three of them. What you're going to see when you're going to see on the real topologies or kind of on the how the real devices are connected you really want to, you don't want to kind of perform an operation between the qubits which are, which are not connected directly. Because in order to do that, you, you need to do something just called swap gate. And the swap gates are expensive in the, 
from the point of view of implementation. So quantum computers can implement them, but they acquire more noise. So you can do a few swap gates, but at a certain time, at a certain moment, you just get too much noise on the current devices and implementation of the extra swaps is just, you know, will wash away any physical results which you have. Okay, so, and the, and the basic idea is based how you can compress those four qubits into the three to the following idea. So that two qubits in ancillary states is the still four states which we need to distinguish. Yes, it's zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. And X on Y multiplication is give us Z. So essentially you can do it like this. So the price for that kind of, you have this a little block which is creating all possible combinations of these states with the different weights which are controlled by the parameters theta one, theta two, and theta three. And if it's zero here, you apply X gate. And if it's not zero here, you don't apply Z gate. So you get X part of the channel. So when it's zero here and zero here, oh, sorry, if it's zero and zero here, you get nothing, you get identity. If it's one here and zero here, you get X. If it's zero here and one here, you get Y. And if it's one here and one here, you got both of them, you get XX, you get Z. So that's how you can compress it. But of course, the price of that, that all these three qubits should be connected to each other. Okay. And you can construct a function, but it already looks quite bulky. And probably in order to find that function explicitly, you can find it. You need something like Mathematica, or you can do some numerical optimization and use one of the methods which Morton was speaking about yesterday. Okay. And there is clearly, at least in principle, you can build the mapping because although you have four probabilities, in fact, only three are independent, yes, because they are normalized on one, and you need to map it to another three real numbers. And in the sectors where they are uh, not periodic, you can build one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay. Okay, so that was everything what I wanted to tell you about quantum simulation, and we're going to, to go and do a couple of these examples in the simulator just now. But the last bit which I want to tell you is the basic And the very basic idea is that, you know, now we're going to do something in the simulator of quantum computer. And the question is like, how can we check that whatever we're getting have anything to do with whatever we want to produce. And in order to do that, you need to do a tomography. And it's an idea which is coming from the experiment, like just from, just from the experimental physics. An idea is very basic. You get a set of inputs and you get a set of outputs. And the question is, what, how you need to design input to output relation. So how many inputs you need and what you need to measure an output so that you can tell what is inside of this box. So, and this is called process tomography and the state tomography is you always throw in one the same thing and you measure here in the output different things so that you can tell what was the state which is coming out. Okay, so why we can do it in the first place? And the answer is because quantum mechanics is linear. Sometimes it's a real problem in the sense like the linearity of quantum mechanics prevent us from having a very nice quantum machine learning because machine learning needs on linearities and the quantum mechanics is linear. So in order to put them together, there are special tricks which people do or there are special non-linearities which people use. Okay, so, but from the other hand, this linearity allows us to do things like a tomography. How it allows us to do it? So. Our generic state, input state, can be written like this. We apply some channel, which could be a, just a unitary operation or some dissipative operation. And due to the linearity, we can always write it like this. So it means that if we know what's happening to every state like this, and the problem is that this is not a state, but we're coming to that. If we know that what's happening to every guy like this, we can reconstruct what epsilon will do to any set of these coefficients, yeah? So, the problem here, as I mentioned, that this is not a physical state, or this is not a state at all, yes? And uh, what you want to do, you want to build the mapping between all possible guys like this and a set of physical states. So you need to choose such input states such that, that you can kind of make a linear combination and create all, all of possible things like this. As a very simple example, if we have a single qubit channel or single qubit gate, we could input this state, this state, this we could not input 
but we also want to know what's happening to this state because they're unphysical. But what you can do then, you can replace them by the plus state and the R state. And you can naive. Guys, this guy, you find what is happening to the kind of real part of this uh, kind of projector but diets. And if you know what's happening to this state and to this state, you can figure out what's happening to imaginary part of that thing. So, and as a result, so in the, if you want to do a process tomography, you'll be inputting for the single qubit those four states. And what you are going to measure, you're going to measure as minimally as is possible. And in case of the single qubit, you will measure three observables, X, Y, and Z. Yeah, so you input in one, zero, plus, and R, you measure an X, Y, and Z. And based on that, you can reconstruct what kind of channel or what kind of unitary gate, because if it will be unitary gate, it will be just kind of written in such a way so that you can write it as U, U, dagger. Okay? So, and uh, if you do a state tomography, you always put it in one in the same state and you are kind of measuring X, Y, and Z. Okay? I think that is it, what I wanted to tell you about the uh, simulation of open quantum systems using the quantum computing. And now we're going to go to the tutorial. Do we have any questions by the theoretical side of things? Okay. It doesn't seem to be the case. Okay, so let me now switch to the... Uh, just give me a second. Because I, I closed my Jupyter. Let me first open the Jupyter and afterwards I will share my screen. Okay, I think... Uh, Okay, almost there. Okay, so where is my zoom? Now let me share. Ah, okay. Besides doing certain calculations faster, what quantum computers do that classical com computers cannot do? And can you simulate a quantum computer using classical computer? Yes, of course. Uh, the answer for the second question is yes, that's what we're going to do just now, because we're not going to use real quantum computer, we're going to simulate what would happen to the quantum computer and the perfect scenario using the classical computer. But the problem is that we're going to simulate a few qubit circuits. And as if you just go to the, uh, if you just kind of play with the qubit, and if you just create a circuit where you can have the number of qubits which you can simulate as a function of your kind of uh, of your parameter. So you can you do it. In, I don't know. You do the simulation for the two qubits. You see how long you stay. You do simulation for the three qubits: four, five, six, seven, ten, twenty, and you will see that very quickly the time which it takes to simulate a very similar and rather simple circuit is increasing very very fast. And if we could believe Google, around fifty qubits, you're going to hit the wall, which will be, I mean, in, in, for, the, for the certain types of circuits. I mean, again, this is very important for the certain types of circuits because there are other types of circuits. I mean, it depends. The number of qubits which you can simulate depends on the type of circuit which you want to simulate. So what kind of gates are you using? Because there is a more narrow class of gates which are better simulatable, but the universal set of gates is kind of like 50, 60 qubits, you're done. So, or if you, for example, if you have some other mathematical statements which allows you to do things better, for example, you want to simulate ground state of some spin system. And the all possible ground states, they live in the subspace of the Hubert space, which could be very efficiently simulated by something just called in the 1D matrix product state, in the kind of 2D, 3D, and so on, it's called tensor network states. And in that case, you can go, for example, with the 1D MPS, you can go beyond uh, 100 uh, spins. But again, you are kind of tackling a very, very narrow subset of possible states or possible operations. When you do things generically, you're very quickly running, running out of memory. And uh, so the main thing about the quantum computer is not just doing the things faster. That again, 
if you need to do a simulation of some generic spin system in some generic state, which have, let's say, just to be precise, 200 spins, which are coupled in some arbitrary way, and we want to simulate not the ground state, but the dynamics of some excited manifold. And how can we do it? And the answer is, there is no way. In the general case, there is no way we can do it on the classical computer. Just because we could not encode the state of 200 spins in anything. But if I would have 200 spins in the lab under control, and I could have a create a simulation environment, which will kind of create a simulate the Hamiltonian of interaction between them, I could take these 200 spins and I could propagate them. And afterwards I will measure them. And by doing that, I will do the simulation. And in this, in this case, by the way, this will be called analog quantum simulation. And this is a separate part of the uh, kind of quantum computing or quantum simulation, because what when we decompose into the gates and using things like Littrotta formula, we're doing something which is called uh, digital quantum simulation. Like also in the classical computing, there is an analog classical computing and there is digital quantum computing or classical computing. And many of you probably are not that familiar with analog classical computing, because uh, digital quantum computing is so successful. But for example, in the 50s, if you want to solve a differential equation and you cannot do it, so what you would do, you and it has some nonlinearities, you would find some, you would do an electric, electric circuit which have nonlinear elements which behave as nonlinearity in your equation. And afterwards, you just push the current through your circuit with nonlinearities and measure the uh, current voltage characteristics, which will be the solution of your differential equation. So when people used to do that, and there are still some systems which are working on the, in a very similar way. Or for example, if you want to know about the narrow uh, classical solvers, famous ASICs, the kind of the narrow purpose or TPU stands the processing units which are created by uh, Google for the machine learning, they're much faster because they, they know how to do only one operation. So the question is not that what we can do faster, there is a certain class of problems which we can do not just faster. Faster, you know, is not is the wrong word. We can do exponentially faster. And this is a crucial concept from the point of view of uh, because like there are problems which classically, I mean, from any practical point, you cannot do. I mean, it's not faster. It's not like from two days to one day. You know, I mean, even that could be very profitable, you know, in in applications or from one year to one month. It's a very good acceleration. But there are some problems, like, for example, the traditional uh, prime cofactors. Yes. So that you can take the key long enough so that in order to do it on the best supercomputers as known to us right now, you will need the lifetime of the universe to do it. So you need another 13, 14 billion years. Yeah. And having a quantum computer using some fancy algorithms, you can do it within a few months, or you can do it even faster. But fortunately, these quantum computers are still quite far away because for that you need to real full tolerant quantum computer. And there are some kind of estimates, for example, done by Google, how long it will take. I mean, like how many qubits we need, how many physical qubits we need, how many logical qubits we need, and the physical qubits numbers are in millions. So it's we're very far because like the best what we have now is within a hundred or less than a hundred. Okay. Uh, what is the maximum number of qubits you can simulate? Uh, it depends on the problem. You cannot, I mean, you can you can have an algorithm which can simulate, I don't know, a couple of hundred qubits if the gate set is narrow enough. So if you have something just called Clifford gates, you can simulate very large circuits. So if you don't have a full universal set, if you throw away some gates, in that case, you can, I think you need to throw away T gate. So you can simulate it very nicely, but you will not simulate this, uh, you will not simulate those qubits, you will simulate a circuit and afterwards you apply it to qubits. So it's kind of slightly different, but, but as a result, you can simulate what would happen. But in the general case, you know, not much, just beyond 50. And I think that's that's exactly what the claims of Google and IBM. Okay. Let me share my screen and let's do some. Okay. So tutorial three, and as I, I'm giving you links also here, just for the 
to kind of to acknowledge the authorship so that uh, the notebook is based on the Mateus Rossi GitHubs, one which is published in the paper and another which is just his a little online textbook. Okay, so we just need to import NumPy. So this we already seen, and this we need for some uh, purposes of uh, of an algorithm which is used by Mattel. Okay, uh, if you don't have a QSkit, you need to you need to run this, and you can do it from the inside. I don't need the QSkit; I already have it. And we're going to use a couple of stuff from the QSkit. So the first one we need a, something just called quantum register. So we need qubits so and we need measuring of qubits so that's a classical registers we need object which is called quantum circuit so that's how the qubits are coming together we need something which is doing running the circuit we need a simulator and if you want to run it on the real machine we need to have this object which is or this class which will contain the tools to communicate with the real machine so i'm going to do a state tomography so we need to have a couple of functions for the state tomography and I'm going to give you some pictures of the block sphere from the QSkit. Last time we've seen the pictures of the block sphere from Qtip. Now we're going to see it from the QSkit. Okay, so let's load it. And let's start with a very simple bit flip channel. Yeah, and we already seen the theoretical part of it. Yes, yeah? so we, we do the Pauli gates. We do our bit flip. Yes, probability P is probability of flip. So with probability P, we do the flip. And with probability one minus p, we do nothing. Okay, so that will be kind of a range of the probabilities which we are going to consider, which could be mapped on time, because in this case it could be just p p is just one minus e to the minus gamma t, but it doesn't matter. It just it just see fifteen values of time, and because p zero is also here, and that will be initial value. What we do, we just create an array of P value kind of the of the same length as the p values of two by two matrices, which will be our density matrices. We start with the excited state and we do the evolution, but that's as the previous uh, tutorial. Okay, now we are going to the new stuff. So what we do, we first do a function which is going to do us a simulation of the bit flip channel, and for that we are going to use so that would be a C naught and R Y rotation. So we create an object which is called quantum circuit, which is going to have certain number of the uh, quantum and classical registers. So our angle of rotation, okay, and we don't need this one half, that's for sure. Uh, so and afterwards we do a controlled rotation. So let's see how it works. Okay, now we have a simulator. And there is one more simulator, but we don't need that. I took the number of shots to be 8,000 which is the maximum number of shots which you can do in one go on the real machine. So, and how this register Q is composed, is composed of the two classical or quantum registers, which we need, and the one classical register, because we measure only one. Yes, kind of the index of the system qubit is zero, index of the zero is one, and we're starting with the zero state. Okay, so and if we take this initial prepared zero state, and we add our bit flip channel, we can draw the circuit and the circuit will look exactly as we've seen. So, and I put here some probability. So, and so this circuit, if we measure this guy, will exactly give us a Pauli X channel with the probability zero comma one. Okay, so now what we want to do, now we want to run many of them for the all possible values of uh, p, where is my p values for the, all the 15 values, but we also want not just to measure something, we want to measure full state, and for that we need to do a tomography, and state tomography works nicely, I don't show you process tomography because that module doesn't work too nicely in QSkit, unfortunately, hopefully they're going to fix it on some stage, so, and here what we are going to do, and I'm going to give you an example of how the tomographic circuits are looking like, so, but we just use the standard uh, module, we're saying that, okay, we want to create a tomography circuits for this circuit and for this qubit, which is replying for the system, and we get 45 circuits. So where the 45 is coming from? We have 15 cases and we measure single qubit. In order to recreate the state of single qubit, we need three measurements, X, Y, and Z. 
we need to measure x projection, y projection, z projection. That's why 45, 3 by 15. Okay, so just to give you how they look like. So this is the examples. So and I can just rerun them so that you know. Okay, by default, so when they are ordered in the order x, y, z. So let's start from the z. Z is just a measurement. So when you measure by default, you measure z. In order to measure x, you need to apply Hadamard gate. So because Hadamard x Hadamard is z gate. So you need to do this kind of artificial rotation. So you apply Hadamard gates because this is the same circuit. You apply Hadamard gate. And from that point of view, you are measuring x in the x basis. And if you do the same with the s gate or s dagger gate, to be more precise, you are measuring in y basis. So you need to do three circuits, same input, but kind of z, x, and y. OK, so now we're doing simulation. So we're doing execute all our 45 circuits on the simulators and with the 8,000 shots. We're going to record our results of the simulation into the array, two by two by the number of entries. Uh, we're going to get the results from the simulator. Afterwards, we're going to process the results and use the tomography feature module, which is by, on the results of measurements, we'll find what is the most likely, exactly as yesterday in the lectures of the Morton, what is the most likely state which could be consistent with this set of measurements? Because if you take arbitrary measurements and with the arrows, and if you just put them together, you might not get a physical state. For example, you do the measurements, and the measurements of x, y, and z components don't sum up to one squares of them. So for that, you need to find, you do the something like maximum likelihood. Luckily, you don't need to think about that. And the QSKIT, at least in the case of the QSKIT, QSKIT is taking care of that. And afterwards, we plot it. We are, we are pl so here, we're going to have our simulated rows, and we're plotting real and imaginary, or uh, element 1, 1, and element 0, 0. And this is our theoretical predictions. OK? And as you see, I mean, obviously, because we're doing perfect simulation without any noise, or not from the real device where you have a lot of noise, we're getting very good agreement. The solid line is prediction by our just brute force channel. And the crosses is our predictions from the experiment. But you can take these circuits, you can run these Thomas circuits on the real device. Afterwards, you need to wait until they execute it. You afterwards need to collect the results. You, you can try to plot something like this, but it will look it will look probably a little bit uglier. What you can do afterwards, you can do the mitigation of the errors of the measurement, and you will get something which is looking quite likely like that one. Okay, so now we can go to the we can plot some of the results of our measurements on the block sphere. Again, we I grabbed from the previous tutorial block vector function, which is taking two by two matrix and spitting out block vector. And we're starting from the first one, and I'm plotting to you the uh, from the simulator maximum likely vectors. So zero is pointing up. That, that was our initial state. And as we go in the time, so for the for the fifth element of the array or six elements of the array, to be more precise, we see that it's getting smaller. Tenth element, it's smaller to the zero and afterwards begin to point down. And the, the last one for the biggest P is just completely down. So this is the example of, uh, of you, how the kind of you can plot it on the blocks here using the QSKIT and you see the sphere looks much nicer than in the Q-tip, but I, I was unable to figure out and I'm not sure that it support multiple block vectors. And I also don't know how to do the movies using the QSKIT and I'm not sure that you can do it. Okay. So the second example, which I want to show you, and I still have a few minutes, uh, is depolarizing channel. So depolarizing channel was one minus three, three quarters of P plus one quarter of XX, YY, ZZ with the probability P. So we need to define it like this. So because it's depolarizing channel and it's kind of compressed from the old direction, we need to choose some vector which have all components. So when we just choose some pure state, which have real and imaginary part, we form a density matrix, which is looking like this. So it's clearly have diagonal components. So it will have non-zero Z values and non-zero X and Y values. 
okay? Afterwards, we form again, doing the same thing, we form an array of possible uh, density matrices after application of the channel for the different probability of flipping. Now, and this is taken directly from the Mateus code function, which is implementing it on the, in the circuit model. Very similar, but now we need to apply. So this is the implementation with the four qubits. So we need to apply Ry rotation on the same angle theta and Cx, Cy, and Cz. And now we can do the, again, build the circuits in a very simple, in a very similar way. So we have four registers here and zero is the system and zero is one, two, three. And just to, to show you how it looks like, and it looks exactly as in the lecture. So this is a standard notation for the controlled node. So it's a Cx. This is a controlled Y gate, and this is controlled Z. And it's looking in the same way, because if you look at uh, as the matrix of the CZ, it doesn't really matter which qubit is a control for the CZ and which is a target. It looks symmetric. So CZ from here to here and from here to here looks the same. Okay, so and now we also form the array of the tomography circuits and we can again give a look at them. And as I've shown you, so this is the X measurement, the same circuit Y measurement and the Z measurement. And we can do the simulation. After the simulation, we can also do the state tomography. We can plot now, we can plot more, we can plot real and imaginary part of off diagonal element, excited state, ground state, and we can compare it to our prediction, which we have done using brute force implementation of the channel. Okay, so, and that's what we see. So we have initial state, which is given by the pure state, which is looking like this. And U3 is a notation of the Q-skid for the sum rotation, which is, which will bring the zero qubit exactly, uh, sorry, where it was, to this state, which is cosine of some pi over eight, sine pi over eight, and the sine also have an extra phase factor, which is uh, e to the pi over four. Okay, so, and here is just a plot of various components. So real and imaginary part of the of diagonal elements, kind of the full solution and the simulation and the same, same for the excited and the excited state. And we see a very nice agreement, obviously. And again, we can play the game with the block sphere. So that's our initial state. And that's, it lives on the surface of the block sphere like this. After some state, because what the depolarizing channel is doing is taking block sphere and compressing it. So it's just, it's pointing out in the same direction, but it's just become shorter. And the last one, it's already could not uh, plot it nicely because it's shrink to the zero for the maximum probability. So in its formula, it's a point, And that's why you see a little bit strange thing because the length of the block vector in this case is really zero. Okay, so that's it for me. And there is a few suggestions what you can try by yourself. So you can, it's very simple. You can try to redo XX channel to Y, y and ZZ channel. That's relatively straightforward. Less straightforward is Pauli channel. But again, in this uh, Git of Mattel, which I suggest that you go through, uh, there is implementation of the Pauli channel and the formula for the uh, angles theta one, theta two, theta three is calculated. I suggest that you try to run it on real QPUs. Again, you go to the IBM webpage, quantumcomputing.ibm.com. You register, it's for free, and you get access to the free devices. And uh, the last thing which I suggest that you can do, you can go to the previous tutorial, to the Qtip, and try to create animation of what's happening to the uh, block vectors under the action of these channels, or under the action of the power channel, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Ilya. <clears throat> uh, Ilya, I don't know if you browsed recently the chat. There might be a few questions that um, some of the participants uh, raised. Uh, I don't think that there is any unanswered question because the last question was, what about how many qubits one can simulate? Uh, and... Uh, yeah. There is, I don't see any more new questions. Do I need to choose the best out of this? Uh, if you want uh, that system. Sorry. That uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah. Ask the last question. Uh, sorry. Um, you up to now you talk about uh, digital quantum simulation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in in the notes, yes, I mentioned analog quantum simulations when I was talking about spin systems and so on and so forth. Okay. 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 And uh, so what did you? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, um, for example, the, I mean, ion traps or other kind of, these are kind of analog simulation or not. I, I don't know exactly. And could you briefly talk about these? Okay. It depends what you do with them. I mean, you can use the ion traps to do both analog and digital. So if you do digital, you need to learn how to control individually ions and how you can implement the universal set of gates. So what you, I mean, the beauty of the digital approach is that you don't need to learn to do something exotic. You just need to learn, okay, so can I read this ion, this ion, and this ion? Good, first step. Second, can I implement a single qubit gate? So can I do Hadamard on this qubit if I want to? Can I do S gate on this qubit if I want to? Can I do T gate? And the last one, you need to learn, can I do C naught? And if you can do this, so if you do, can do Hadamard, S, T gate, and C naught, and you can do it individually and you can do it fast enough, you are in business. Because using the solo Kita, if you can take arbitrarily unitary and decompose it into this set of gates and you just implement it and afterwards do it out. Okay, so this will be a digital quantum simulation. Next thing is analog quantum simulation. So if you're saying, that, okay, no, I don't want to build a universal quantum computer. What I want, I want to, for example, simulate a decay model. So and I have my ions, which will play the role of two-level systems. Now I can use this common uh, vibrational mode. I can simulate the bosonic field. And now if I let it evolve, and if I will control my situation so that it's still described by the James Cannon type of Hamiltonian, and afterwards you read out something, it will be described by the, you're going to have a simulator of the decay model. So in, the, in this case, it's called analog simulation. Of course, the problem is, a very important problem with that. With the digital quantum uh, computing, there are theorems which are guaranteeing you that if you can maintain certain level of error, you are 100% sure in the result. And this is called, I mean, altogether it's called full tolerant quantum computation. With the analog, the problem is that you don't know that on some stage, suddenly your system is no longer described by the Hamiltonian which you're simulating. And for example, if you simulate your system in some difficult regime, like for example, you simulate some nonlinear interaction, which have a chance to go chaotic, for example. Do you know that your Hamiltonian, which you are simulating, is still that Hamiltonian, which you pretend to be simulating? And how to solve that? It's a very serious question, because we, by now, we're much better in analog quantum simulation than in digital one. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the analog quantum simulation always has a uh, specific purpose or, or we don't have universal computation in analog? Uh, not, not, not really. I mean, people, people try to formulate some universality, but I think the main problem is that you cannot say anything systematically about the error of that thing. Mm -hmm. Because you, you cannot say like when, when you begin to go off. There is a, a wonderful researcher in Germany called Jens Eisert, and he have a very beautiful graph of uh, Bose, kind of dynamics of the Bose Einstein condensate. And it's a very famous picture. So you can, in a million of his talk, you can see it. And it's like, there is an excitation and afterwards some wiggling. So when this was measurement of the Bose Einstein condensate, and in the beginning of that graph, somewhere like in 10%, there are dots, which was at the moment when he first presented that, co uh, that code was best possible calculation using this matrix product state. And he said, that, okay, so we have this first 10%, which we can verify. But all the rest, we don't know. And can we believe that or not? This is a very serious question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, Ilya, thank you very much. <clears throat> Did you choose the, 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 the question of the afternoon? Uh, the last question was quite interesting. But I think Omit already have got the voucher. So I think that the very nice question of Paola about the correlated environments is also the interesting one. Okay, 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 very good. Then I will make... Can, uh, can you please share your email? Yeah, perfect. I, I made a, a note. Okay, fantastic. <clears throat> then uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone.
Ilya, thank you very much for another nice, uh, nice lecture. And uh, I'm sure all the participants will, will try to reproduce your, your notebooks this afternoon <clears throat> or this evening. And, and, and we'll be ready again uh, for some action tomorrow morning at nine. So thank you very much. Uh, again, everyone, for being with us this afternoon, and and, and have a good evening. And Ilya, thank you very much. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.